Greetings, friends. It is Tuesday, November 17th. Wow. And uh, we've been reading through David Stendhal Rast's book on gratefulness, the heart of prayer. I really like what he has to say today, particularly about leisure. And I'm going to read a text from the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, uh, which was a text that was important to Jesus, actually. So maybe you can go back and read chapter 34 in Ezekiel if you want to know why. Uh, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 16. This is the message. God, the master says, from now on, I myself am the shepherd. I'm going looking for them. As shepherds go after their flocks when they get scattered, I'm going after my sheep. I'll rescue them from all the places they've been scattered to in the storms. I'll bring them back from foreign peoples, gather them from foreign countries, and bring them back to their home country. I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel, along the streams, among their own people. I'll lead them into lush pasture so they can roam the mountain pastures of Israel, graze at leisure, feed in the rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. And I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make sure they get plenty of rest. I'll go after the lost. I'll collect the strays. I'll doctor the injured. I'll build up the weak ones and oversee the strong ones so they're not exploited. So he says, I'll lead them to lush pasture so they can roam the mountain pastures of Israel, graze at leisure, feed in the rich pastures of the mountains of Israel. And in this chapter, um, Ezekiel is recording God's upset with how The skinny sheep, the sheep have been asked to do the hard work, uh, have carried the weight of the work on their backs, which is not right. He's talking about justice. I think there's another place in the Bible where Jesus talks about sheep and goats. Hmm, I wonder where that is. Anyway, we've been talking about contemplation and leisure, and today... Uh, we're going to talk about, do you remember how this works in personal relationships? You think you are safe with someone. I know how to handle him, or I've got her number. But if you keep a relationship too tightly under control, it soon gets boring. So you open up a little. Right away it gets adventuresome, but risky too. You never know what will happen next when you begin to give yourself to that adventure. When you get scared enough, you quickly clam up again. Sometimes we keep going back and forth between giving and taking back, opening ourselves and clamming up many times a day. But life is give and take, not give or take. Spasmodic gasping is one thing. Healthy breathing is another. When we take a hearty breath, we give ourselves to the air we inhale, and when we give it out again, we take a quick breath from breathing. This balance of giving and taking is a key to healthy living on every level of life. In fact, balance too is too mechanical a word to apply to the intimate intricacy of this give and take. We are talking about a giving within taking and a taking within giving. Once this is spelled out, it is hardly necessary to stress the fact that we are not playing off giving against taking. By no means, we are playing off a living giving, give and take, against a mere taking that is as deadly as a mere giving. It matters little whether you merely take a breath and stop, or give a breath and stop there. In either case, you're dead. Most of us need a good deal of encouragement for giving. The way we are built, or rather forced into a warped shape by our society, the taking takes care of itself. 
we it might be a good test if you check for half an hour how often you say I take and how often I give. The language we use gives us away. I take a course, take an exam, take a vacation, take a room, take a ride, take a car, take a trip, take a left, take a right, take a rest, take a walk, take a swim, take a drink, take a meal, and finally, when I'm worn out by all that taking, I take a nap. Or at least I try to take a nap until I find out that I will hardly fall asleep until I give myself to that nap and let the nap take me. But some of us are so set on taking, so unable to give ourselves, that we must knock ourselves out with sleeping pills before the poor nap gets a chance to take us. This brings us to the topic of leisure. To recover a healthy understanding of leisure is to come a long way toward understanding contemplation. But few words we use are as misunderstood as the word leisure. This shows itself right away when we speak of work and leisure as a pair of opposites. Are the two poles of activity really work and leisure? If this, this were so, how could we speak of leisurely work? It would be a blatant contradiction. We know, however, that working leisurely is no contradiction at all. In fact, work ought to be done with leisure if it is to be done well. What then is the opposite of work? It is play. These are the two poles of all activity, work and play. And what we have come to understand about purpose and meaning will help us to see this more clearly. Whenever you work, you work for some purpose. If it weren't for that purpose, you'd have better things to do than work. Work and purpose are so closely connected that your work comes to an end once your purpose is achieved. Or, how are you going to continue fixing your car once it is fixed? This may be less obvious when you are sweeping the floor. Can you go on sweeping even when there is not a speck of dust, dust left? Well, you can go on making sweeping movements with your broom, but your purpose was accomplished, and so the work as work is ended. Sooner or later, someone is sure to ask why you are playing around with that broom. What was work with purpose has now become play. In play, all of the emphasis falls on the meaning of your activity. If you tell your friends that you find it very meaningful to dance around your broom on a Friday night, they might raise their eyebrows, but they cannot seriously object. Play needs no purpose. That is why play can go on and on as long as players find it meaningful. After all, we do not dance in order to get somewhere. We dance around and around. A piece of music doesn't come to an end when its purpose is accomplished. It has no purpose, strictly speaking. It is the playful unfolding of a meaning that the, is there in each of its movements, in every theme, every passage, a celebration of meaning. Pachelbel's canon is one of the magnificent superfluid, superfluid, superfluities of life. Every time I listen to it, I realize anew that some of the most superfluous things are the most important for us because they give meaning to our human life. We need, to the, we need this kind of experience to correct our world view. Too easily we are inclined to imagine that God created this world for a purpose. We are so caught up in purpose that we would feel more comfortable if God shared our preoccupation with work. But God plays. The birds in a single tree are sufficient proof that God did not set out with a divine no-nonsense attitude to make a creature that would perfectly achieve the purpose of a bird. What could that purpose be? I wonder. There are titmice, juncos, and chickadees, woodpeckers, goldfinches, starlings, and crows. The only bird God never created is the no-nonsense bird. As we open our eyes and hearts to God's creation, we quickly perceive that God is a playful God, 
a god of leisure. But let us be careful not to fall into opposing leisure and work. Leisure is the balance of work and play. Leisure gives full measure to both. Yet even this could be understood. Too quickly, someone might say, yes, when I play, I have a good time, and when I work, let's get over with. A perfect balance, isn't it? Well, not all that perfect, it seems to me. Should I not also have a good time while I'm working? People who spend their working hours with no mind for anything but purpose are unlikely to begin playing when their free time finally comes. I know people like that, do you? I've never been like that. Either they will collapse and slump in a chair with a glass in their hand, for that kind of work wears one out completely, or they will be so set in the groove of mere purpose that they will continue to work. Unable to play, they will either work overtime, or if they pick up their golf clubs or tennis rackets, they will give themselves to a work out. We are simply unable to play playfully unless we learn to work playfully. To work playfully, doesn't that sound almost frivolous, given the attitude toward work that was drilled into many of us? Working playfully sounds to us like fiddling around. And yet the most efficient work is done leisurely. And working leisurely means putting into your, our work what is the most typical play, namely the emphasis on meaning. Leisure gives meaning to purpose, makes room for meaning in the midst of purposeful activity. The Chinese character for leisure is made up of two elements that by themselves mean open space and sunshine. The attitude of leisure creates an opening to let the sunshine in. I like that. One late morning, I saw a shaft of sunlight fall at a steep angle into the human-made canyon of Wall Street and understood what that ancient Chinese ideogram for leisure could mean for busy New Yorkers. I like that leisure means open space and sunshine. When our purposeful work is also meaningful, we will have a good time in the midst of it then we will not be so eager to get over with it. If you spend only minutes a day getting this or that over with, you may be squandering days, weeks, years in the course of a lifetime. Meaningless work is a form of killing time. But leisure makes time come alive. The Chinese character for being busy is, all, is made up of two elements, heart and killing. A timely warning. Our very heartbeat is healthy only when it is leisure. Wow. What a difference between the Chinese elements for leisure, open space and sunshine, and the Chinese character for being busy, made up of heart and killing. Our very heartbeat is healthy only when it is leisure. As many who I may be talking to can account for when their heart gets out of kilter, they are out of kilter. Sometimes we're not even getting the amount of oxygen we need to our brain because our heart is not beating at a leisurely pace. Very interesting how we are trained in this country to work, but not very leisurely, very often, right? Let's pray. Almighty and wonderful God, there are people today who cannot work leisurely because they are on the front lines in a virus that is very serious. We pray for them today. We pray that there will be moments when they are aware of the impact they are making and the leisure with which they need to do it as much as they can. We are grateful, God, for all of those who are working 
in those in the special places here in our country and around the world to help curb this spike of the pandemic. We pray that all people everywhere, everywhere, will put masks on, keep a distance, be safe, and do the things that create wellness and well-being so that we can open full tilt as soon as possible. We pray for all of the companies that are working for a vaccine, and we pray that it will come quickly. And in the meantime, God, we don't want them to take too many shortcuts where it won't really work when we find out later that there were issues with it. We pray that you work through the minds and bodies and spirits of those designing this vaccine, that they will know what leisure is, truly work leisurely and well. We pray today for ourselves, God, that we may learn that work is not only for a purpose and everything else for play, because that will kill us, as the Norath said, but that we work for a balance of work and play, a leisurely balance, that we work with one-pointed attention, one thing at a time with our full attention, which enables us to work more leisurely than if we are scattered in a million directions, no matter what we are doing, God. We are grateful today to be reminded of this important fact, that we may live in the leisure of your arms, in the balance of this life that you show us in your creation every day with all the different birds, like Stendhal Rest spoke of, and so much more. God, we're so grateful that you have given this earth to us, and we pray we will take care of it and take care of each other. With your love, your love, your love, which is at the basis of everything. And we pray a prayer of love that Jesus taught us. We pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Wow. Every day this month, I've been saying something that I am thankful for. And I have to say, I'm thankful that I'm learning more about leisure in my life. I've taken some big things in my life that had to change before that, before I became as aware as I need to be of it. I pray that I will only live into it more and that you will too. <laughs> 